Welcome to Genuine Humans, exploring the stories behind the great marketing leaders of our time and hearing how their journeys have influenced the brands they've built. Brought to you by The Social Element, here are our hosts, Tamara Littleton, CEO and founder, and Wendy Christie, Chief People Officer. Welcome back again to Genuine Humans Podcast. And as ever, I'm here with Wendy Christie, my co-host. Hello, Wendy. Hi, Tamara. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. There's a lot of rehearsals going on. When I'm not running my business, I'm I'm singing in the Natural Voices Choir and it's it's full on Christmas season. We've got six concerts to squeeze in before Christmas. So yeah, it's a bit full on. That sounds fantastic. Can't have too much Christmas in, in my book. How about you? Yeah, good. Thank you. A nice, Just a nice busy week heading into the weekend. Exciting weekend for me, last Grand Prix of the season. So raring to go. <laughs> raring to go indeed. Well, we are joined today by Mark Evans, MD of Marketing and Digital for Direct Line. Mark, it's lovely to have you here on the podcast. Lovely to be here and I share Wendy's enthusiasm for the forthcoming finale to the Formula One season. It's going to be close, eh? Yeah, absolutely. So, Mark, I know that on our podcast, we like to know about the person behind the brand. And could I just sort of take you straight back? I want to know, did you fall into marketing? Were you pushed? (laughs) Um, Tell us where your journey is sort of how you got to where you are now. Well, um, firstly, I I skipped over saying thank you for giving me the opportunity and and, uh, hopefully some of the sort of slightly haphazard circuitous journey that I've taken through my life might, might have reference for many because very few people go through a squiggly, a non-squiggly life journey. Indeed. Well, if I, if I talk about how I got into marketing, it was very much a happy accident, uh, not planned at all, insofar as very early on, I wanted to be a forensic scientist. That never materialized. Then I did a degree in economics and was told, well, you're either going to be a, a banker or an accountant. And I really didn't want to be an accountant. So I got a graduate job in banking. Well, kind of. I deferred it for a year. And then that job disappeared in a puff of smoke uh, with a merger in 1996. And so I was unemployed or made redundant from a graduate job that I hadn't even started. I hadn't even set foot in the building, in fact. So that was a bit of a kick, but it it forced a reappraisal in terms of what did I want to do. And then I went back through the milk round process and applied for more marketing commercial oriented roles and and ended up in Mars. And and I think it was such a gift because I probably would have been rubbish at finance, (laughs) or at least I don't think I'd have joined it nearly as much. But so for me, like so many people, it was a complete accident. And so we'll maybe come on to it. The the School of Marketing that I'm very happy and privileged to be involved in is to try and help more people to make a deliberate decision, particularly from diverse backgrounds, Mm. to get into the marketing industry. Because I think it's a wonderful place to have a career. Fantastic. And so so in those early days, so you started at Mars. So what happened after then? Kind of, I'd love to know a little bit more about your your path. Yeah, well, um, I mean, Mars is brilliant. Loved it. Uh, I think it was talking about purpose and customer and brands and DNI decades, mm. um, way before I joined, but decades before these things became in vogue. Um, so I really like the culture. I probably would have stayed forever, but I can only summarize to say that my, my career has been a string of redundancies. So I was made redundant before I'd even started working. That was yeah. the, the graduate job. After 10 years, there was a big European restructure and was asked to move to Germany, but it was sort of middle of nowhere in Germany and my second son was just born. And so it was more of an elective process, but essentially my role disappeared. So I was made redundant there. Then I went to 118, 118. I did four years there. It was crazy, brilliant, loved it. As crazy as the advertising, uh, global restructure, uh, made redundant there. And then I went to HSBC and it was pretty good, but quite limited, uh, literally two years to the day was made redundant there from a, a European restructure. So, you know, I, I suppose I've always landed jam side up. Yeah. But it's been a bit, a little bit rocky, but but I would say it makes me quite resilient. Uh, resilience is easy to get as a concept, but it's only really acquired through proper difficult stuff and hardship. And each time I've had to double down on what it is I really want to do, what I don't want to do, it brings out your A game when you're made redundant. Well, I mean, I, I entirely... Uh... Agree because it can bring opportunities. I know that when uh, when I started uh, the social element, I, there was a round of uh, redundancies, and I took voluntary redundancy and saw it as my opportunity to start a company. So um, I was I was kind of intrigued 
because that's four times some people would be, you know, a little bit down about that. So how did you kind of draw on that resilience to to sort of keep pushing forward? Well, it's, I mean, it's easy to be reductive in the rearview mirror. Um, I mean, of course, redundancy isn't necessarily personal. It's typically about the role. Um, of, of course, it massively feels personal at the, at the time. I remember the last time I was made redundant, which would have been about 10 or 11 years ago, going home telling my eight, nine-year-old daughter, you know, trying to explain the mechanics of, you know, restructuring, don't need the role anymore. And, and she looked at me and she said, so, Daddy, they just don't really want you anymore, do they? And so, you know, it is, of course, personal. But you, you do get a bit practised in recognising that the sky is not falling. Uh, you have great strengths that can be helpful in the right place, the right context. I always got super proactive. I've been placed with the same headhunter three times. Yeah. So there's a bit of a well-trodden path there. I don't know. I, I just suppose, you know, many people, hopefully myself included, just have an inner resolve that when the crunch comes, you give your best. We'll, we'll probably make lots of sporting references and metaphors today. Um, but, but for me, you know, rugby captaincy really defines everything I think about leadership in business. And, you know, it, you, you lose some games, but you, you, you still enjoy it, um, hopefully, and you, you learn from it. And it's not about what's happened. It's about what happens next. Absolutely. Well, actually, let's let's dig into the, the the rugby now. Actually, I'd love to hear more about why that's important to you. Yes. Yeah, so it's it goes back quite a long way. At the age of two, I, I don't know if, if social services were tuned in. They might have been concerned, but I ended up in hospital quite a lot. But not not through any wrongdoing. It was basically I, I thought I was a bit of a superhero and just was having accidents all the time. I had a, a ton of sort of stitches and broken bones or whatever uh, doing stupid things like sort of maybe thinking I could fly and I jumped off a kitchen table and landed <laughs> in the corner of my head on a on a paint pot and, and had quite quite a big gash there so so I was, so anyway one time I ended up in Cardiff A&E I think we were on a boat and I slipped and fell down and hit broke my nose and hit my nose on some steps and I had some stitches put in you know I I, I didn't think too much other other than screaming my head off then three years later, we were watching England Wales rugby with my dad on the telly, and this chap, JPR Williams, scores an amazing try. And my dad innocuously said, "Well, that was the guy who put the stitches in your nose." And I remember thinking, "Wow, that's that's quite a cool thing, you know, that this celebrity or sports celebrity, uh, you know, I, I I was in his presence and he helped me and all that." And so, at uh, uh, age of six, next season, I joined High Wycombe Under Eight Bs and started my love affair with rugby and played for 20 odd years and I played to a decent level. I played for English universities and captained some good teams and just loved the whole experience of being the, the camaraderie, the, the strive as a team, the winning and losing together, putting your head where it hurts on behalf of others. I, I do think rugby is a special blend of quite a humble uh, sport. And, um, yeah, and, and that, as I said, really defines everything I think about rugby, uh, about about business leadership, and particularly as we've moved to agile within Direct Line, an agile approach which is synonymous with servant leadership. I think that sort of primes me quite well for recognizing that you create the the culture, the context, the conditions for others to succeed. You don't have to make all the decisions. You don't have to feel like you need to be in the glory role all the while. But uh, there, there's a lovely book actually called Captain Class by Sam Walker, which highlights why the 16 best sports teams in the world have been the best 16 sports teams in the world. And, it, and it's not about the coach or money or um, the best player. It comes down to the character of the leader. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, the things that Sam Walker outlines are synonymous with rugby captaincy. Mm -hmm. So it runs pretty deep and I use the metaphors all the time. And I know it sort of looks like a game of meatheads kicking the crap out of each other, but I think there's a few layers. And also rugby is a game of diversity because it is all shapes and sizes. Uh, and so maybe not an obvious link, but for me, that was one of my early ins into you know, everybody brings something different and diversity is a thing that drives inclusion, but also performance. I, I kind of feel like that everyone should do team sports before going into business. I think it's it's such a powerful uh, way to sort of connect with your uh, to the rest of your team, but also such a powerful thing for for leadership. Um, I, I went through the journey of playing lots of sort of hockey when, when I was young and, and uh, at university, and I still draw on that experience running the team. And I, I think 
I was a hockey goalkeeper. It's a different type of of leadership. It's more kind of leading from from the back, I think. But uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm with you on that. I think it's so powerful. Yeah, it's an interesting point. There's I, I, there's one leadership model I really love called the coactive leadership model. Coactive. Uh, and it is very explicit about the different roles of leadership in, in very simple terms, leading from the front, which sometimes you have to do in sport, but also leading from behind, you know, de- deliberately being putting yourself to the back and letting others step forward, leading from the middle, which is very much about, you know, your own personal radar and purpose, and then leading from the side about the, the culture that you create. But it's a very sort of vivid and obvious way to say, you know, you need to take one of those four positions, yeah. but it's not always the same one. And uh, it, it varies depending on the context. Sounds like you were pretty sporty and, and adventurous as a, a kid, Mark. Are there any other traits from that time that you still think are true for you today? Yeah, I mean, well, I'm ultimately a quite competitive bugger. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I do like winning, I have to say. And I, I suppose, you know, that was that was my thing. That was what sort of got my parents' attention, got me noticed when I was a, a kid less so you know my, my brother and sister different things probably so th- that's definitely endured but I mean that sounds a bit egotistical and heavy so for me the orientation is competitive and winning but as a team or as a business and so I'm, I'm, I like to have a, an enemy to conquer but it would more be Aviva or Hastings than <laughs> you know my peers because that could be quite damaging but I, but I would say, and maybe this is just an age thing, I, I, I've probably had one, well, I, I know I have softened. And yeah, maybe partly age, whatever it is, but you know, there's, there's an edge that you have to take off sometimes. So there's hopefully a bit more empathetic as a leader to balance the competitiveness. There's a bit of a collision between the two, but yeah, but I mean, I'm still really competitive. I, I, you know, so I, can, I can still beat my son at chess and pool, but every other form of physical activity now towers above me. Um, and so I, <laughs> So, but I've noticed that I've sort of come to terms with that. So it's a slow process, isn't it? As your, your kids sort of outgrow you. I, I, I worried that I would be a super competitive dad and I've actually softened on that, but I'm still competitive, but I think it's just channeled towards some of the things I do. For example, some of the charity stuff I do, which is fundraising, you know, that's, that always drives my determination. And then also, you know, the, the success of the business I work in. Fantastic. And, and you mentioned that you'd wanted to be a forensic scientist, uh, when you were little, I think. Was there anything else? Were there any other careers that you thought you might want to go into? Uh, well, I mean, maybe sport, but I don't think I was ever, I knew I was never quite good enough. Well, rugby wasn't professional until it was probably too late. Well, I, you know, I knew I wasn't going to make it there. And maybe the forensic scientist is not a, not a bad little story just to talk about. I, w- I was always quite good at science and maths. I'm more at the commercial left-brained end of the marketing spectrum than the right brain creative end uh, forensic scientist yeah, well I was nine years old and the person I sat next to at school was being escorted to, to school by police every day which is quite a thing when you're nine mm-hmm. and it's because there were death threats against his family in fact his mother had um there was an attempted murder on his mother oh in a car goodness. bomb anyway it's a very very long story short forensics in those days quite basic had had actually revealed that it wasn't an attempted murder it was at all stage and it was the father who tried to murder his wife for an insurance job oh my gosh and it uh, but anyway this was made into a series called indelible evidence it was one episode of there's also been a book written about it and so you can imagine how captivating all of this was for a nine-year-old so that's where the forensic scientist thing uh started but then when i got to a levels i just loved economics and so Mm -hmm. that passed by the way but it's quite quite interesting story how sort of uh, impressionable we are at that tender age when our circumstances are, you know, catch our attention. Absolutely. It's quite a big story though, isn't it? I mean, I think it's, <laughs> it's probably quite natural that it ended up sparking something in you. And thinking about the people that either that you've worked with or just people that you've known over the years, who are the genuine humans that have really helped to influence you? It's, it's a cliche and it's the obvious thing, but I would say definitely my wife. Um, she mm. is a nurse, has been a nurse for 20 odd, 25 years we were sort of in halls together at university I we always say I was the first boy that she met she was the second girl that I met but we had uh, boyfriends girlfriends so it wasn't until my 20th birthday that we actually got together but so so Lorna brings a bit of a balance because she doesn't get all this commercial la la uh, nor would I necessarily <laughs> want her to uh, and so that's quite a grounding force a couple of other key individuals the first coach I ever had a chap called Gary Wills at Mars 
I remember I was very achievement oriented, very task focused. And he would ask me these really sort of quite annoying probing questions about, you know, how do things feel and how do you think you need to develop and how do you reflect on that situation? And I was like, what really is this, you know, is this important? Uh, so he, <laughs> he helped, he helped me to understand quite a few things, including gifting me the book, Oh, the places you'll go, which has been hugely influential for me. It captures, it's a kid's book. It's a cartoon, uh, but it, it captures the point through an adult lens anyway, that we all go on an undulating journey. You, you will be successful, happy, content, of course, but not every day, week, year, project, relationship, company. Um, but it's those undulations that make for a great story and give you energy and learning and so on. So Gary Wills was very influential. Um, I'd say also Sherilyn Shackle. Yes. Now I think about it. So Sherilyn gave me a, quite a big break, really. I got into the fellowship in 2014. And that was that was a really pivotal year for me to you know lock in my flavor of leadership, what I wanted to do, what I didn't want to do. Uh, so that was an accelerating year doing the fellowship then. Um, but, you know, I think there's, there's good in everyone. And so, uh, you know, I am an optimist uh, and I like to see the good in everyone. Um, so there's, there's been a ton of people that either through their marketing capability and or their perspectives on life um, have been hugely influential. And, and so I do do a podcast and we've interviewed 75 great people, understood their story probably should get you on it at some point in time. And, and we do something similar to this, but really go a bit into what makes them tick. Mm -hmm. uh, and so hearing how amazing people like James Brett, if you're familiar with him, the guy who founded Plant for Peace, or you know, even Martin Sorrell, frankly, but Paul Polman, some great people, marketing, CMO, CEOs. You, you know, it's hard not to be inspired by the, the, the stories of everybody's lives. Do you want to give a little plug to your podcast on this podcast? Yeah, Friday morning, eight o'clock, The Places Will Go. It's Richie Mehta, who's the founder of the School of Marketing, uh, and myself. Similar format to this, just finding out how people have gone on their journey and very specifically how they bounced back from adversity. And we try to normalise struggle and normalise squiggliness. So if people themselves are feeling like they're not doing very well, then they can put it in perspective that that's very normal and it, you often are successful because of failure, setbacks, adversity, rather than despite them. I love that, what you're saying about the, the, the squiggle. I mean, I think the people that we talk to and I guess the people that we just know in our lives, I think they just kind of, we kind of dismiss our squiggle a little bit as if it's somehow not a legitimate way to get where you are you know you did wasn't you didn't study the thing you're doing at uni or you, or you didn't always have this as your plan but those squiggles definitely make us who we are yeah 100 percent. i mean it's i mean job for life has gone obviously but more specifically the, the world the pace of change is increasing you know who'd have thought pandemic you know but many people are having to make more pivots and so it's you know it's darwinian stuff isn't it you've got mm -hmm. to be prepared to adapt and evolve all the while. I mean, even take take nursing. You know, what nursing was 25 years ago was pretty submissive, do what you're told sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it has grown to being, you know, nurse prescribing, nurse administering, um, involved in surgery. You know, so that as a profession which has become much more skilled and scientific. Uh, so even if you thought oh, you wanted to be a nurse for your life, you're going to have to adapt and evolve all the way through. Yeah. So. Um, I think that adaptability point is, it's, you know, ob an obvious one and a lot talked about, but, you know, we all have to show great adaptability, even, even in the same role. And let's talk about that adaptability from your point of view, because obviously you mentioned pandemic, we, we're still going through it. A lot has changed over the last couple of years, but um, how has it been for you personally and, you know, the way that you've led your teams? I have to say that I found it a real challenge because, my style of leadership and I think marketers more generally, there, there is an in-person thing, the chemistry, mm. the creativity, taking messy problems. In-person is a thing. And so I've been quite frustrated having to do that all virtually. You know, it's we've all had that challenge, over-communicating and being make sure there's a lot of clarity and support and listening and all, all those things. But out and out, I've missed the in-person thing. And so... I haven't, over the last few weeks, prior to Omicron, been doing more of a 50-50 thing and trying to create congregation days for the team. So if, you, if you're 
it's a bit of a catch-22, isn't it? People are thinking, well, I want to go in, but I only want to go in if I'm going to see other people. If everybody thinks that, it's a stalemate, nobody goes in. So Tuesdays in Bromley in our head office have, have become a bit of a thing, but I think that might that might wane now as Omicron rides through. But So I, I found it frustrating um, and at times thought, you know, this feels like I'm living in a game or in the Truman Show. Yes. Uh, when you're sat and everything is channeled through square screens. But it, but actually in the last six months, having a bit more interaction, we've been quite principled about having our Exco meetings face-to-face. You, you, you're reminded of how brilliant it is to be around people and it gives you optimism that, you know, we'll, we'll get past the pandemic and we'll get rid of some of the things that we didn't need and keep the things that were really valuable and probably net-net have a better work-life balance that we didn't know we didn't have. Um, so that's a good thing. But it's been a real struggle. And I defy anybody who says it hasn't mm-hmm. uh, because that with with change comes adjustment and adjustment is painful. And then the other side of that pain comes the, the learnings and the benefits. So naive to think that it wouldn't be anything other than quite painful. And it certainly has been for me at times. Mm. You've been at Direct Line now for 10 years, I believe. What would you say you're most proud of in, in that time? Yeah, 10 years. I mean, I didn't grow up as a boy dreaming of working in insurance. I've already made that clear, but I didn't know what I didn't know. It's turned out to be quite fascinating. It's very highly regulated, very competitive, very open dis- to disruption because it's basically data and IT to a large extent uh, under the hood. Uh, so it has been quite a captivating experience. Th- there's, a, there's a couple of things, actually. The, but the, probably the biggest one is actually 2014 where we relaunched the direct line brand it was going it was in a nosedive that's a problem because it was really where our group makes most of its money and picking that up out of a terminal decline not just me personally but you know great effort internally and with agencies won three ipa effectiveness goals uh, 16 and 18 has been described not not by me but but I'll, I'll you know I'll take it or I'll listen to it as the the brand turnaround of the last decade um, an amazing moment where going back to the basics of marketing actually works and delivers a proper business transformation. So I think that's that's probably my biggest moment for Direct Line. Ironically, the Winston Wolf campaign, which brought us great success, obviously we've moved on from in the belief that there was something even better rather than it actually just not starting to work. So, so it would be the tr- transformation of Direct Line. Outside of work, it would very clearly be the, the creation of the Sprintathon charity that I, I started 2016 which has now raised three quarters of a million pounds for stand-up to cancer. And this is democratising the marathon. So having large swathes of people run segments of a marathon, 420, 200 metres makes 26.2 mile marathon. And uh, every time I do it, I get two emotions. One is this, this is amazing. It feels like school sports day all over again, followed by, but is this the whole thing just bloody silly? <laughs> where people will travel for two hours to get to a 400 meter track and run a hundred meters and that's it. But people seem to love it. The, the donations still keep coming in um, and I'll carry on doing it. I promised my daughter one day it would get to a million pounds and that now looks like it might be possible. Uh, but that's, that was the, that's probably the only thing I can think of. It was genuinely my own idea. And so I'm obviously, obviously quite, quite fond of it, but it is a, it's a great fun thing. And I would urge anyone to get involved for next year as well. So we actually got involved for the for the first year. Yeah. And what was lovely is that other teams were helping out because it was a time where you know people had sort of dropped out because I think there was another wave of infections and and, and things like that. So we had people from other teams coming in, sort of subbing in for us as well, and it was just lovely. So yeah, I, I definitely urge everyone to get involved next year. So looking outside of what you're doing, though, who else is in, impressing you? Which which brands are really impressing you at the moment and why? Well, that's a good question. Obviously, we're right in the midst of Christmas advertising, although, although the marketing community sort of thinks it's all done by about this time in December, but <laughs> yeah, because we're sort of a bit bored of the conversation. I was a bit surprised that Boots hasn't got a bit more fanfare. So I like... I like Pete Markey as well. I think he's a great guy, their CMO. They're doing some very clever data-driven marketing stuff. And I thought, I really like that ad. Um, but then it's hard not to like Kevin. So, but, but maybe if I move beyond Christmas advertising, the brand that's hottest for me, and this is partly because my kids are incessantly asking, can I have this for birthday, Christmas, or whatever it is, uh, Gymshark. Yes. So uh, having watched a few things on Ben Francis, I think what a, what a great guy uh, to, 
be running a unicorn in his 20s. So ambitious. He he talked the other day about, you know, why can't Gymshark be an Apple? Why can't we extend the brand franchise into many, many things? And uh, so I think they're, they're one of the hottest brands right now. And all, all credit to him and good luck to him and the, and the company. Uh, so, and he's very open on some really principal things. You know, he's very explicit about the salary he takes and where he puts his time and how he, he's trying to help people. Uh, I think, you know, that's that's probably my stand there right now. All credit yeah. to Ben. You've been in the industry for, for a while. What do you think we still need to change? I speak quite a lot about the marketing of marketing. It still gets quite a bum rap often. It, it, although it does vary. So in Mars marketing rule, the roost, it was the strategic function, the finance function. You know, it was everybody who was in the senior roles had either come up through marketing or spent chunks of time there. So there it wasn't such a big deal. But in everywhere else I've worked since, marketing is always within a hair's width of being seen as a colouring in function. Mm. The very last meeting or very close to before the pandemic face-to-face meeting was with a graduate who was rotating on the scheme from procurement into marketing. And I asked him, how did he feel about coming into marketing? And he said, honestly, when I first found out, I was a bit nervous because I was rubbish at drawing at school. And uh, I think he realized he probably said something a bit silly. And then he did try and cover himself by saying, I've been surprised at how data driven and digital it all is but you you couldn't really take it back. But it just reminded me, I chuckled, but it did remind me that the job of convincing the rest of the organisation that marketing is anything other than a colouring in function is is never done. And I have that conversation with with Penny, our CEO, and she said, oh, yeah, you've done that, haven't you? Well, no, that job is never done. It only takes a couple of changes in key stakeholders and you're back to square one. So so what? I think there's a lot lot to do to build capability and commerciality inside marketing teams so that they talk the language of finance, talk the language of the board, um, mm-hmm. are conversant on the key commercial drivers. You know, the, the so what of marketing is made vivid as opposed to that very classical default that it's the communication function. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that job will never be done just because it's marketing is a thing, talk is projecting and predicting a future. And most of the organization, risk functions, finance functions, planning functions are building forward on the back of facts from the past. So they're just very different flavors. Uh, And so brains work in different ways and we'll need reconvincing them of marketing's value. Thank you, Mark. So we're going to move on to now to the the last section of the podcast where we're going to get a little bit more personal. So we'll start with an easy one. What's your idea of a perfect weekend? And does that involve any guilty pleasures that we need to know about? Well, to my wife's dismay, it would involve a lot of sport. <laughs> so, you know, w- watching rugby, going to the rugby, the Formula One. And my son plays a lot of hockey. He'd love to go to watch him play. And of course, you know, the sport is in such abundance. A bit, bit, a bit miserable over the ashes in, in Australia at the moment. Uh, but, but balancing that with, we've got a, an aging dog who doesn't have long walks, but, but they just take a long time. So. Mm-hmm. We, we love going for walks in the wood with, with Bella, um, whose back legs are going slash gone. Uh, we, we live in a smallish town, about 25 miles west of London. And, and I think it's a lovely community town. Um, so we're, we're, we're pretty happy with our lot. But I, you know, I, I do like to recuperate a bit because we, the weeks are fairly intense. Mm. Um, so I'd love, love also to do, do some sport myself, uh, whether that's running or cycling. And then uh, my guilty pleasure is a bit of a weird one. <laughs> or at least my family think I'm really weird. So I, I read the, the Wim Hof method. I don't know if you're familiar, but the, the Iceman, the Dutch guy who... A friend keeps telling me to read yeah. it. Yeah. So I read that when I was on holiday and I started with the cold showers and I'm now sort of hook, line and sinker. So my indulgence was to buy like an alpine wood um, ice tub. So it's not too big. It's, it's definitely for one. So I do, I do do ice baths, which may not sound like the most <laughs> pleasurable of things, but trust me, it, I, I really, maybe it's placebo effect, but I really think it works. It's very mind cleaning. Right. And obviously restorative, particularly from a sort of physical injury point of view. So, um, you know, I can, uh, I don't have to sort of squeeze it in awkwardly during, as I do in the week. At the weekend, I can, you know, properly get in three degrees water for 10 minutes and, and feel good about it. But yeah, maybe not everyone's guilty pleasure. Can you combine it with a standing desk though? I don't know. 
Yeah, well, um, possibly. Although it's hard to think about anything when you're just focusing on being in cold water, not even concentrating on your breathing. It's just literally your mind. You don't. You just don't get the opportunity to think about anything. Yeah. And I think that's that's the benefit. How to switch off the noise, um, even temporary. I also do the the breathing meditation side as well, half an hour every day. And I think that's that's probably it. You know the the indulgence is actually slightly counter. It's to, it's to switch off the noise. Right. Maybe I'll give that a try. I've sort of, <laughs> I've sort of dabbled with the, the 30 seconds of cold shower at the end of the proper nice hot shower. <laughs> I think yeah. that probably doesn't really count. Honestly, I, I've had this conversation with a few people at work. Cold showers are much harder than sitting in cold water because your, right. acclim- your skin acclimatizes, whereas in the cold shower, you keep getting cold again as you sort of move around. Yes. Um, so... I don't know if that's really a full sales pitch, but 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 trust me on that. I do like the the, the mind cleansing, the the switching off the noise. It certainly sounds appealing. So on a different note, um, we've talked about a few of your jobs. Um, and I hope none of them would fit into this category. But have you had a worse job? I've had a few. So I worked in the greengrocers, and they were really tight. So we had to sort of pick out all the non manky fruit. Uh, that was pretty horrible. I worked, <laughs> I worked in a a garden center actually i didn't mind it but it was very very physical yeah you know, humping 40 kilo bags of irish moss you know for customers into their cars but probably the pick was working doing data entry for bt during my year off when I, my main focus was rugby uh, it was just mind-numbingly boring the only highlight being this piece of magic which was when we rang people up and we asked them for their postcode and and then and you would say and what number Claremont Gardens is that? They they would think it was astonishing that we had a, <laughs> that we somehow knew the road that they lived in when we when we knew their postcode. But but I obviously I got bored of that piece of magic pretty quickly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, so it, it, probably what did I what do I take away from that? So yeah, I'm, I'm not very good at repetitive stuff. So Mark, I'm going to ask a, a cooking related question. What's your signature dish? you cook to impress well I, you know I, this is a bit of a point of contention in our house because i say well i used to be a good cook but i i'm not anymore because partly because of lack of practice also lack of confidence because bless alona will say things like yeah you can cook but i'd rather do it because i want to enjoy it <laughs> oh, I want it to taste nice. so so i don't do that i'm, I'm more in the warming camp and maybe another guilty, weekend guilty secret is when, if Lorna's away with her mates, reunions or whatever, then my, my goal is a, um, a zero washing up weekend. <laughs> so, which I, which I know doesn't sound um, particularly sort of healthy or whatever, but no, I, I'm, I'm definitely not the cook of the house, more into warming. But, but I think when time passes by and come out the other side of an intensive exec career, I, I'm pretty sure I could resurrect all that and... Uh, our new CIA who's just joined talks about his his love of cooking, and that's probably his mind cleanser. I think again, it's yeah. so absorbing, isn't it? Mm. Uh, so, yeah, bit a bit of a pass on that one. I'm afraid. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> okay, so if you were to write a book, what would that book be about? Yeah, I know quite a few people have written books, and and it doesn't feel particularly attractive right now, just because I think of the the time commitment. But but if I were to do so, it would be centered on a really core construct in my life, which is the achievement of success and significance simultaneously, as in how do you have the and, which which is the dot, dot, dot into how I describe my purpose. But th- there is a bit of a backstory um, just, just to explain why I would say that, which is that on the night of my graduation, and I have told this story a few times, so some people listening back might have heard it, but hopefully it still resonates. Night of my graduation, five of us are going out for a pretty low rent curry in Nottingham city centre with friends and loved ones, very low rent joint. But my best mate, Matt, his father says, do you mind if I say a few words? And it was not inappropriate, but a bit of an odd thing to do because it just wasn't that sort of place where you chink champagne glasses or anything like that. But anyway, we, would, we needn't have worried because it turns out he's a really, really good speaker. And this is what he said. He said, as I look before you, I'm jealous. And the reason I'm jealous is because from this position, you can achieve almost anything in the world. But at the same time, I pity you. And the reason I pity you is because for 20 years, you'll go in search of success. And then after 20 years, you realize that it's not about success. It's about significance. 
but the really smart people figure out how to achieve success and significance simultaneously. And so it's it was quite a haunting set of words in a good way. Mm-hmm. And in truth, probably I didn't listen to it hard enough in the first 10 years of my career, but it stuck. And it made me realize that, you know, that there's a right way to do things. There's a balance there. And, and you can have both. And the, the intersection of both lies purpose and abundant energy. And it will be defined very differently by different people. What is success? What is significance? But I think it was a, a gift as a set of words. So I'm, I'm very happy to pass it on. Not mine, but, you know, pass it on. Really powerful. And, and around that, I've built my own thoughts and I suppose approach to, to coaching and mentoring around how to help people to achieve increased performance and increased fulfillment. So you can see this, the, 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 the relationship there. But often it's seen as a trade-off. I need to sell my soul to get on in the extreme. But actually not at all. You can achieve both. I think that's partly mindset, but very specifically, it's knowing what you're really good at and doing more of it, as simple as that. You know, Olympians have great performance and great fulfillment basically by just doing one thing extremely well. Okay, that's not relevant to everybody, but in the main, often people are far too focused on the things they can't do at the expense of focusing on the things that they can do and doubling down and doing more of that what you're what you're wired to do. Which is kind of how some people describe purpose. But for mm-hmm. me it's just, you know, what makes you tick? What, what what where do you have a where is it easy for you to have a disproportionate impact, even down to a task level or stuff you enjoy doing on a daily basis? The clues are there of what it is intrinsically because we're all a product of our past, what intrinsically mm-hmm. you're wired to do. And do more of that. Well, I do hope that you do find the time to write that book in in the future. Yeah, it's just time, isn't it? I you know. know this. It's just time. My goodness. I mean, you look at the people who say I'm, I'm mid editing a book and they're bleeding from the ears and nose. Uh, I'm thinking, yeah, need to be doing something different to, to find the time for that right now. Well, speaking of finding the time, <laughs> if Tamara and I had it in our power to gift you an extra hour each day, what would you do with it? Yeah, so assuming that I've already done my ice bath. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and done a bit of exercise. It would be coaching, uh, mentoring. I enjoy doing that and try and do that into, you know, bring, bring that and the fulfillment performance thought into almost every conversation. It's, there's a way, and that's why I love a purpose, which you can be in almost every conversation as opposed to mm-hmm. sporadically. But yeah, I do. I, I, and truth be known, at times, a succession possibility has been to move into HR. Uh, I'm attracted to leadership and development conversations. Mm-hmm. And I could imagine in a future life moving into some form of executive coaching or something like that. So, yeah, I, I, I enjoy doing that. And I thought, in fairness, I already try and do quite a lot. But if I had an extra hour, it would be good to do mm-hmm. a, a bit more of that, actually. Lovely. And how would your friends describe you? And how would you like them to describe you? Hopefully it's similar. Similar. <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of people uh, who have similarly had successful careers. So hopefully it wouldn't be about, you know, the, the, the whole success dimension. I think, you know, I'm, I am synonymous with the sprint amongst my friends. Hopefully somebody who sort of gets, maybe has a bit sort of wacky ideas, gets passionate about stuff, a, a bit of a catalyst. So, if, you know, if we're going catalyze that you know let's go to the pub sort of thing um maybe a little bit of a pied piper uh, just because the sprinterthon i've done in my local community a few times Mm -hmm. and so yeah somebody who's got a bit of energy and a bit of spark hopefully i don't know i probably should ask them (laughs) but uh something along those lines hopefully yeah gather the data yes Yes, indeed indeed don't make too many assumptions could be wildly wrong (laughs) Mark, it's been an absolute delight to talk to you today. Uh, before we go, I want to give you the opportunity. Is there anything that you want to talk about that we didn't ask you? Or you can just sort of have the platform and, and have the, the final closing thoughts? Well, that, that's very kind to Murray. Yeah, so, I mean, I, obviously, success and significance is a, is a big one. But the, the closing thing I'd like to talk to is actually about enjoying it. And the reason I say that is my reflection on the first half of my career as I was very task focused Mm -hmm. and didn't really stop. It was always a bit next, next, next. And I got to meet Johnny Wilkinson, who obviously won with England the Rugby World Cup in 2003 and asked him how it felt to to win it. And he said, I felt nothing. It was really hollow and empty as a moment, which is not what I expected at all. But he was also in the extreme, next, next, next. And so I think... 
sometimes you have to force yourself to stop and think about enjoying stuff. And, and where that epiphany came actually was from 2006 with the very first sprintathon. I was very stressed. It was midday, two hours to go. Is this whole thing going to work? You know, biggest reputational risk I've ever taken. And it was my uh, my daughter who almost grabbed me by the shoulders and said, Dad, make sure you enjoy it. And honestly, I don't think I would have done unless she'd said that. It's it's almost a contrived act to make sure that you enjoy it. And I, 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 when I've talked about this in the past, I've said that... I, some clever people who are getting married say, let's contract a meet at eight o'clock on the hill to look at the proceedings, to sort of step out from it, to appreciate it. I think when you're in it, it's hard to appreciate things. So I think we all need to make the time and effort to enjoy things in the moment. You've been listening to Genuine Humans, Brought to you by The Social Element. If you loved what you heard, remember to subscribe or you can find out more at www.thesocialelement.agency.